Well, Revelation 4 starts the next big unit in the book of Revelation. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 were the opening unit. And here we begin a big unit all the way up to uh, chapter 17, where another unit begins. The sermon I preached on this section, I called the one seated on the throne. And if you've taken time to read the chapter already, uh, that will become very clear to you that all the focus is on the throne and the one sitting on the throne. If you haven't yet taken time to read the chapter, I really encourage you to pause the video, read through this chapter a few times, spot the repetition, uh, put some question marks along the way as you go, just to highlight areas that you are still unsure of. I hope that this video will answer some of those questions. Um, but this is just to get you going. You can dig in a whole lot deeper than what you'll get just from this video. And spend some time praying that God would open your eyes to understand the glorious truth that he's revealing to us in this chapter. And as always, I'm just going to highlight some of what I've seen in this chapter. The reason I said this is a, a new unit is we get a couple of things that show us that we are moving to something new. It says, at once I looked and at once I was in the Spirit. And we saw this in chapter 1, verse 10. And we see it here again, 4, verse 2. We will see it in 17, verse 3. And in 21, verse 10. And they are big units showing different things uh, that, that John is about to notice. And we hear the Spirit says, come up here, I will show you what must take place after this. From this point onwards, we, we're going to see in chapter 5 the scroll and the one who can break the seals and open that scroll, the Lamb. And that scroll is the unfolding story of history. And so this whole big section is uh, the unfolding his history as we know it, uh, the last days that we're living in right now, and a description of that. Uh, when we see this again, as in the Spirit, from chapter 17, we're going to start seeing the final end of evil, and then chapter 21 and 22, we'll see the glorious end for those who are, as chapters 2 and 3 called us to be, those who are victorious, we get to a very, very glorious end. But in this chapter, after in chapter 1, we saw uh, this glorified picture of Jesus among his church saying, do not fear. Then in chapters 1 and 2, he both warned and encouraged the church to keep going, to make it to the glorious end victorious. But then in this section, uh, John is taken into the throne room of heaven. We see that here. What we'll see throughout the book of Revelation is that from the throne, uh, all the action that takes place uh, comes out from the throne. We'll see that in the chapters that come. But this chapter is just setting us up so we know exactly uh, what this throne is and exactly who is on the throne. We also see in this picture 24 other thrones. But more than just a throne in heaven, there is someone sitting on it. And we're given a description of this one on the throne and by the time we get to this song, it's very clear this is the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, um, him who sits on the throne. So the whole thrust of this chapter is pointing us to this one seated on the throne. Everything revolves around the one on the throne. It's kind of a constant throbbing pointing us towards this one on the throne. And right as the chapter begins, we are told about the voice that he had heard at first. So that's chapter one, pointing us back to the voice of Jesus, who he saw the glorified Jesus. And Jesus says, come up here to heaven and I will show you what must take place after this. The after this is referring to everything we see from chapter six onwards. But before we see that scroll being opened and the unfolding history in chapter 6 all the way through to 17, uh, Jesus wanted John and he wants us to behold this one on the throne. And this is where the NIV translation unhelpfully misses a word that is there in the original. So 
it should say after this I looked and behold uh, behold is uh, imperative so a verb that is a command um, John is saying behold him behold this one and then again in verse 2 here and there and behold there so John doesn't want us to miss this one on the throne behold him Something we see a lot of in Revelation is this, I looked and I heard. In apocalyptic literature, those are important words that just help us to see. He was, the curtain was being pulled back on the heavenly realities and John was being shown something that we don't see in the normal course of life. And the rest of this chapter makes it clear that he's seeing something that is very different. A couple of the details that we see that this one seated on the throne had the appearance of jasper and ruby. We see a rainbow and this emerald. Now, precious stones like this in Revelation or in apocalyptic literature in general, they are symbolic of the glory of God. And if you jump ahead to chapter 21 of Revelation, where we see this um, ruby, uh, jasper is mentioned again. So in 21 verse 11, we're told that the new Jerusalem shone with the glory of God like a jasper. So all of these are used to point us to the glory of this sovereign king sitting on his throne. But don't miss that it says here a rainbow shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And the rainbow is the sign of God's mercy all the way from the days of Noah. So the one seated on the throne in all his glory with the rainbow, the sign of God's mercy around that throne. And then John's attention is drawn to something just surrounding the throne. And we see these 24 elders. And they are going to appear a number of times throughout Revelation from this point onwards. And it is important for us to to think about who are these guys, who are the 24 elders. And I think the, the most helpful place to go is to the end of Revelation again in chapter 21 and 22, where we see the new Jerusalem being described. And we see there the gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 foundations after the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 12 plus 12, 24. So this is the 24 elders are representatives of the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles who represent all of God's redeemed people from both the Old and the New Testament. And here they are, um, they are spiritual heavenly representatives around the throne of God's redeemed people. And there are other details that just confirm this. Uh, we see that they are dressed in white. And that's if we look back to chapter 3, verse 5, those who are victorious will be dressed in white. And we see that they had crowns of gold on their heads. And if you look back to chapter 2, verse 10, again, those who are victorious will be given the crown of life. So these are symbolic of the redeemed people of God dressed in white with crowns on their heads. Later on, we'll see them laying their crowns before the throne. But these are the redeemed people of God. But then again, John's attention is drawn to the throne where these flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and the Old Testament context that we should think of here is um, Exodus 19, where at Sinai we hear of the mountains on fire, lightning and thunder. Um, God and all his glory is there. But what we see in the rest of Revelation is that this is um, a sign of God's judgment. If you look at 8 uh, verse 1 and 5, look at 11 verse 15 and 19, 16 17 and 18, you just see that uh, thunder and lightning are used as descriptions of God's judgment. So we don't only see uh, God as a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. 
sitting on this throne, those who stand against him, those who are not victorious, they will be judged by this God. And in front of the throne, we're told there are seven lamps blazing. We saw this in chapter one, where these, he says these are the seven spirits of God and Seven being that picture of wholeness, completeness in apocalyptic language. And this is the description of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1 makes that very clear to us. So here we have God the Father on his throne. We have God the Spirit there in front of the throne. Chapter 5 is going to show us a glorious picture of God the Son. But at this point, it is God the Son pointing John to what he sees. God the Father on the throne. God the Spirit there. And then the scene kind of concludes the first part of chapter 6, what looked like a sea of glass as clear as crystal. Now again, Old Testament context is helpful here. If you go and look at Exodus 24, verse 10, um, or Ezekiel 1, which is particularly important Old Testament context for what we see here. And what we see here is that all is at peace. The sea in Revelation and apocalyptic language is often used as a description of a chaos. You can't control the sea. Where here, this is a sea of glass, absolutely still, as clear as crystal. All is at peace. All is as it should be. With this one seated on his throne, ruling the God of mercy and judgment, in his presence, all is at peace. But just because all is at peace doesn't mean that all is quiet, because it definitely isn't. And structurally, we have two big sections here. And if these first verses are telling us to behold, these next verses are telling us to worship. Behold the one on the throne. But the right response to this one on the throne is to worship him. And so in the next verses, we're introduced to four living creatures. Again, we'll see them often in the book of Revelation from this point onwards. Uh, the first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of these four living creatures had six wings and our minds start to boggle. What is going on here? This seems very bizarre to our modern ears. But again, this is where we see that all the Old Testament prophets rendezvous in Revelation because these four living creatures have been mentioned before. If you go and read Ezekiel chapter 1, I will see them. Yes, the picture is slightly different to the picture that is given here, but uh, Revelation, apocalyptic literature, clearly likes to mix its metaphors because these four living creatures, which we meet in Ezekiel 1, we're then told in Ezekiel chapter 10 that they are cherubim. And then these six, uh, six wings uh, sound very much like the seraphim who we meet in Isaiah 6. So we've got Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, a very important Old Testament context here. And these cherubim and seraphim are the highest order of um, heavenly beings. And there they are in the closest circle around the throne. And what we'll see them doing is they are orchestrating worship. They are causing all heaven to worship the one on the throne. And not only is all heaven worshipping, as we continue in Revelation, eventually we'll see all creation, everything, worshipping this one on the throne. And we hear that day and night, these heavenly beings in the presence of God, encircling the throne, never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And again, that is a direct quote from what the seraphim say about God in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah had a vision into the throne room of heaven. So we've seen this before. And we've also seen this description of God before. 
in chapter 1 verse 4 and verse 8 of chapter 1. He who was and who is and who is to come, he is the Lord God Almighty, God the Father, and he's on the throne and constantly these living creatures, these representatives of, of all creation. So we've got the first living creature was like, it's not saying he was a lion, he was he resembled like a lion, like, like a man, like. And some have said, well, like the lion is the king of the meat eaters, the ox is the king of the plant eaters, the the man is the pinnacle of God's creatures and the eagle is the king of the the birds and so here they are representative of all creation all the whole created order worshiping and getting everyone to worship this one on the throne and then we see that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one on the throne Glory and honor and thanks. And there we go. Glory and honor and power. Now, the whenever the living creatures do this is day and night. They never stop. So they're constantly doing this. And whenever they do this, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. This is the one who lives forever and ever. The eternal God. And this picture in heaven is meant to show us that for since this creator God created all things, all creation has been pointing back to the creator in worship. And in the heavenly realms, we see this happening day and night. They never stop saying. We see it's very clear that he's wanting us to see this is um, all creation. God as creator is in focus here. In chapter 5, we'll see that uh, God as Redeemer, Savior, through the blood of the Lamb, He's in focus there. But here, this never stopping singing causes the 24 elders, remember they represent all of God's redeemed people throughout history, they fall down before the one who sits on the throne and they worship. And that is kind of the important climax of this section. Not only are we to behold him, behold, behold, worship him. That is what the heavenly angels, these cherubim and seraphim, are orchestrating the worship of this one on the throne. And God's redeemed people worship him and lay down their crowns before him. And they sing this most wonderful song. You are Lord God, you on the throne, the one who is a God of mercy and judgment, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. And John was told to come up and behold this one on the throne, to see this worship and hear this worship of the one on the throne. He was in prison on the island of Patmos and he needed this vision because this was showing him that right now in his day and for us right now today, right now, God is on his throne being worshipped and praised as he rightly deserves. And this has been recorded for Christians throughout the ages that Despite how things look from an earthly perspective, God is on his throne. He is ruling. He is a God of mercy and judgment. He is in control. And God on his throne deserves all worship because he is the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And he is worthy of all praise because he made us. He is the almighty king. And so this whole chapter is causing us to look at this one on the throne and the right response to him is to join all the heavenly beings in worship to this one on the throne. Chapter 5 is going to start as we see a scroll in this one's hand and the rest of the story unfolds from there. But before we get there, John wants us 
Jesus wants us to behold a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it and listen to the song holy 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 lord god almighty who was and is and is to come you are worthy our lord and god to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being it's a wonderful chapter to dig in and to take some time to behold god in all his splendor in all his glory and it should cause us to be among those who worship him and so as you dig in further i pray that this will fuel your worship of our great god and that it would cause you to help those who you teach to behold him and worship him rightly well god bless as you dig in further <music>